Melvin, tell our dear listeners how they can support the show. The best way is to subscribe and leave a five-star rating and a written review. That's right. And tell a friend. Additionally, you can head over to lifeofxpodcast.com and click through to our support page, where you will find several alternative options, such as Audible, where you can go through our website to receive a free audiobook, our Amazon button, which will allow you to make your purchases that will also benefit us at no additional cost to you, and Patreon, where, if you so choose, you can contribute to the show on a per-episode basis. We appreciate all of your support. I appreciate your patronage. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Arif Chadala. And I'm Melvin Barnes. And that makes this The Life of X. Good morning, Melvin. How are you? Fantastic on this bright and early autumn Saturday morning. Man, autumn in Columbus, beautiful. It sure is. We're here for part six of Sean Kai-shek. We promised to wrap this up this time, man. (sighs) Man, it has been a journey. It has. Uh, Before we dive right in, we would like to express our thanks to a few people. You know, as we always... Enter the show and exit the show. We ask for your support, especially in leaving us iTunes reviews, because that is very helpful in getting our name out there and helping other people find us. And some of you have, and we appreciate you, and we would like to recognize you on the show. So, Melvin, would you like to read one of our reviews? All right. The first one we have says, Wealth of Knowledge. You can tell the hosts do their homework to provide a great synopsis of the biographies covered. Easy to listen to and very entertaining. This is from Alex Lipinski. FallGal30 writes, Really interesting. I really like the way these two guys interact. I like biographies. I've read many, but I've never listened to one. The podcast moves along, but I feel like I really got to know who the person Wilt Chamberlain was, not just what he became. Looking forward to more. So, thank you two very much. We will continue to read these, and we implore you, dear listener, to leave us one so that we can read it on the show. We also had a few people sign up to become patrons on Patreon, which was really cool. Something I wasn't necessarily expecting to happen this early. Woohoo! We had two people who chose to remain anonymous. One signed up at the $5 tier and one at the $2 tier. Real quick, for those of you who aren't familiar with what Patreon is, it more or less allows you to kind of subscribe so that whenever we release an episode, you would donate on a per-episode basis. And these tiers allow us to sort of reciprocate. So along with you supporting us because you like what we're doing, we also are able to send you some swag. So at the $5 tier, Anonymous1 is receiving through the mail a thank you note and a Life of X sticker and also a Life of X coffee mug. At the $2 tier, you'll be receiving a thank you note and a Life of X sticker. And we have one other patron. That's Jenny Perry. Woo! (laughs) J-E-N-N-Y Perry. She is coming in at the $2 tier. She's going to get her thank you note and a uh, LOX sticker. If you, dear listener, would like to receive any Life of X swag, you can head over to our Patreon page and become a patron. We appreciate you. Be one of the first. Get in early. Get on that ground level. We need you to be a part of the vanguard. That's right. Anyway, now that we've got all our thanks and gratitude out of the way, Melvin, let us conclude Sean Kai-shek. Let's do it. All right. Do you want to give us a quick rundown of where we left off? Man, so last time we concluded World War II, and it looked like the Chinese Civil War was just about to bubble up. Things were getting real. Chang had had some success in the initial fighting. He's now taken over Muk Den and Changchun, and uh, it looks like he has the communists on the ropes in Manchuria. So it's May 1946, and George C. Marshall had replaced Hurley, who was our uh, Native American guy from the U.S. who was known for getting off of planes and letting out the war cry. Screaming in front of communists. That's right. And so Marshall has replaced him, and he has been charged with trying to broker a peace agreement between the KMT and the CCP. Yeah, and if you remember, he thought that he's had a lot more success than he's actually had. 
you know, initially he had put out an agreement between the communists and the KMT to have a sort of armed forces fixed ratio. Um, initially, that armed force ratio was supposed to be 14 to 1 in favor of the KMT. But given the developments in Manchuria and the level of the fighting, he revised that to be a 5 to 1 KMT to communist forces ratio. Mukden and Changchun were both in government hands, and Lin Biao was still avoiding major confrontations. It's important to remember that any time that the communists were overmatched, uh, Lin Biao was able to retreat and flee over the Amur River and kind of regroup and just go back at it again. And Lin Biao is a communist general? Yes, yes. Okay. Very good communist general. If you remember from the last episode, he's, uh, he, he was doing a little bit of work. He's going to be doing a lot of work in this episode. All right. Well, fantastic. So Lin Biao is avoiding a lot of these major confrontations, and the KMT is actually doing well fighting in Manchuria. But Chang thought they were doing even better than they really were, and that kind of skewed his perception of the confrontation in general. So when Marshall's 15-day ceasefire gets agreed to, it sort of saps the morale of the KMT, and it also wasn't a long-lasting ceasefire at all. You know, obviously with the KMT generals, Chang included, thinking that things are going so well, the ceasefire, like Arif said, sat morale, and it provided a little bit of breathing space for the communists to kind of regroup. Just a little bit, but, you know, it's hard to even call this a ceasefire, considering within hours of the agreed ceasefire, fighting broke out near Qingdao. That's fantastic. Uh, but in other parts of China, you know, obviously the ceasefire held a little, a little longer than a couple hours, but it was only a 15-day ceasefire. And in July of 1946, uh, the government launched a, another offensive. And real quick, when you say government, you're referring to the KMT. Yes, okay. to the KMT. So this uh, offensive in July was largely successful. It captured all of the rail lines that Chang wanted, but at the end of the day, the costs were extremely high. Chang lost one-fifth of his troops and en enough U.S. supplies to organize 18 divisions. And that's one thing that we have to remember is that the communists, whenever they defeated you in battle, they were very good at stripping all of your material, getting all the guns, the ammunition. Being bandits. Yeah, they, man, they would leave <laughs> with all of your stuff after they uh, ambushed you. And also in October, they seized, you know, in the book, what is referred to as Kalgan, but it's actually a place called Jiangjiakou, which is very important here because it kind of was the bridge between Manchuria and then the old communist base area in Yan'an. So it was important to, to link those two areas. And when this happened, things had gotten so bad, even, even clearly to Marshall, who seemed so divorced from the situation previously, he threatened to quit because of this nationalist offensive. The communists lost 100,000 men. And on a sort of brief aside, while this is all going on, Chang's old friend, Gen General Stilwell, uh, dies of liver disease. There was a ceremony that they held at this time, but Chang didn't mention any of, you know, anything about Stillwell in his diary. And I know we talked about Stillwell quite a bit in our, in our last uh, few episodes, but I do want to kind of emphasize the fact that throughout Stillwell's time with Chang, like he had really contributed to this coloring Chang in like a negative light for the United States just in general. And so like, even I remember Taylor in talking about Marshall, Marshall was pretty much pro CCP. You know, he was very friendly with Zhou Enlai, and I don't think it can be understated the effect that Stilwell had on the way that the United States viewed Chang. Yeah, Stilwell was probably one of, if not Chang's greatest American critic. And obviously, uh, Chiang Kai-shek has a lot of American critics, and a lot of what he, you know, the criticisms that were leveled at him were deserved, and some weren't deserved. So, you know, obviously, given Stilwell's role in undermining Chang's image in the United States, I'm sure deep down there was a part of Chang that was not necessarily sad to see Stilwell go. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's reflected in the fact that Chang, who was someone who kept a very detailed diary, didn't really mention Stilwell's passing. Yeah, so. I don't know. What's worse? 
being ignored and like not being put in the diary or getting being like, I'm glad he's dead. Dragged in the diary. What's, I don't know. I feel like this is more cold hearted to just not even mention it. Like it's so, such an insignificant thing that happened. Man, the opposite of evil is apathy. So let's get back into it. He visits Taiwan. Yeah, he takes a trip to Taiwan in October of 1946, and he's like, yo, Taiwan's pretty dope. There aren't many communists here. Which, not the communist part, but when I first went to uh, Taiwan, I was like, dude, Taiwan is amazing. Yeah? Like, Did you note the absence of communists? I, I did not note the absence <laughs> of communists. But it was like, it was, it was a nice place. Um, and that's exactly what Chang took back from all of this. He, he noticed- was like, I could see myself living out my life here. <laughs> he said uh, he noticed that 90% of uh, Taiwan's industry was back up to pre-war levels. Um, and Japanese properties were under government control by this point in time. So it's important to remember that Taiwan became a Japanese colony following the first Sino-Japanese War. So the second Sino-Japanese War is essentially World War II for the Chinese. And that, that first Sino-Japanese War took place in 1895. So by this point in time, you know, Taiwan had been a Japanese colony for 50 years. And obviously the Japanese invested on the island. So now all of those investments, the industry, things like that, these were all in nationalist hands. And Chang, when he goes to Taiwan, he's like, yo, it's kind of nice. And at that point in time, he's already considering, he's like, man, if stuff goes bad on the mainland, I can get out over here and they'll never be able to reach me. If nothing else, I could summer here. I guess that was the, would have been the best case scenario. Yeah. At this point in time, you know, I guess democracy is in the air. Uh, so he returns to China and there's U.S. elections in 1946. So these are the midterm elections in 1946, which is funny because we're coming up on the midterm elections right now. As we record, not as you listen to this, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Not as you listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> and the Republicans won a key victories in that midterm election in 1946. And I think deep down, Chang thought that this probably boded well for him. Uh, so, you know, to kind of inflate his uh, government's democratic credentials, uh, he decides to hold a national assembly. He's like, look, us too. Yeah. And this is important because it essentially, if you remember way back to episode one or two of Chiang Kai-shek, we talked about this Sun Yat-sen talking about the need for this period of tutelage where you know, this country would essentially have a strong man that would set China on the right path. And then after that, they can hand over democracy to the people because, you know, in their minds, the country was too divided. They weren't ready for democracy. Democracy is hard. So what this essentially was, was Chang calling for an end to that period of tutelage. Now, I think it's an end just in namesake. Yeah, that's um, definitely what it sounds like. Yeah, he was still going to be running around sort of like a strong man. So he proposes holding a national assembly in part to show that democracy was progressing. And the, the Chinese Communist Party did not take kindly to this. Uh, because you remember, you know, the Civil War is breaking out, but it's also going on within the context of these sort of ongoing negotiations. And the CCP looks at it and says, well, if you're going to hold these, this democracy stuff right now, obviously the Chinese Communist Party cannot serve as a legitimate government party because we're trying to kill each other. Uh, so you holding this assembly right now is, in a sense, a way to lock out the Communist Party from government representation. So that was one of the accusations. And Chong's like, I see no problem with this. Right. And naturally, because of this, KMT T conservatives dominated the assembly. But it wasn't all great for Chong because Chong was very worried about, obviously, U.S. aid. Now, this holding of the assembly did not necessarily sway the United States government. Marshall believed that, and he reported this back to the U.S., that it was absolutely useless to pour any more men and money into China. And I can see why he came up with that assessment, because the KMT, you know, China's economy was, it was not doing very good. He frequently talked to Chang about how poor the Chinese economy was doing, and Chang had this idea that because the Chinese economy was an agrarian economy, so I don't know if we ever talked about this, but obviously up to this time, China has been a largely agrarian state. Most of the people in China do not live in cities. They live in the countryside, and they're farmers. Chang believed that because they were an agrarian state, the country could carry on for three years after a total economic collapse. All right. Just, I, I mean, I'm assuming because people are trading in commodities. Yeah. 
It's like, well, if you got grain. We can barter. Right. So he thought that the economy could weather quite a bit. And Marshall disagreed. Yeah, vehemently. (laughs) And this leads into the end of 1946, and we get into Christmas. And basically, by, by December of 1946, the Americans are like, we're pretty much done with this. Truman's like... I didn't want to be the president, and China can handle its own stuff. <laughs> right. Truman issues a statement stating that the Chinese must solve their own problems, and that the U.S. essentially regretted that they had not been able to help to solve this schism that was going on in China. And in the meantime, there was two accusations that U.S. Marines had allegedly raped a female student at Peking University. And this sparked enormous outrage throughout China. You see this a lot in this in China prior to 19 prior to 1949 when you had a lot more sort of western military men or just individuals stationed or living in China where you would have something, you know, one of these people would do something very bad against uh, a member of the Chinese population and then bam, there's a reaction to this bad actions that these people were taking. And this was no different. Um, but it was important now because it kind of stained the US image in China at least at that time. But, meanwhile, Chiang is back at home. Chilling. Chilling, enjoying a really nice Christmas. Everybody's hanging out on this panda skin rug. Which is so strange to think about. I know. Because like, for my entire life, pandas have been like the image of, we have to save extinct an- or you know, right. en- endangered animals. Like the, was it World Wildlife Federation's logo is a panda. Yeah, and I'm not even going to lie. I went to Southwest China, saw some pandas. Lazy creatures. They just sit around. All day. Maybe these are those ones in captivity, but I was like, I don't know about these animals, man. What do you expect them to do, Melvin? I don't know. Just Run animals. around, be bears. I don't know. <laughs> what do other bears do? Find honey. <laughs> I don't know. All right. uh, the author of our book, Mr. Taylor, says that this would be the last Merry Christmas that Chong would have for quite some time. And he was, uh, he was absolutely right. After the New Year, basically 1947 marks a turning point in the... Chinese Civil War. Marshall is recalled in January of 1947, and he releases a fairly balanced report blaming the CCP and the KMT for the lack of unity in China. But again, the Chinese economy is in absolute shambles. The military expenditure is as high as 50 to 90 percent. That's insane. Yeah. And it's also... I was just thinking before you even said that, that it is so hard to wrap your mind around how high the inflation was in China. Ridiculous. I'm trying to remember exactly when this comes in, but there's that one point where we may be getting ahead of ourselves. I will, you know what? I'm not even going to say it. All right. Don't say it. Yeah. Can you imagine 50 to 90% of the budget being spent on military stuff? Sometimes you hear that as a criticism of the United States spending. What are we at? 5% maybe? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know what the actual percentage is. Two, two to 5%, somewhere between there. But it's not even close. You know what I mean? And Can that's you... a lot of money. Yeah. It's, uh, That is a, a mind boggling amount of money spent on the military. I don't know. What do you do with the other 10%? You've got another five, 600 million people that you've got to take care of. Like, where do you build? I don't even know. You don't have to take care of them, Melvin. This is an agrarian society. They'll take care of themselves. Exactly. <laughs> and then uh, Chang's brother, T.V. Sung, who had been managing the economy. And basically, this guy's like, he's like that really good doctor when somebody should have died. But he's just like, you know what? I'm going to keep you alive. That's who what T.V. Sung was. Like, the Chinese economy should have died long ago. But he had been keeping this thing running uh, for some time. So now with him stepping out of the way, it's like the, the bottom is really set to fall out of the Chinese economy. And, and then at the same time, you're starting to see more protests. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and this doesn't, if I recall correctly, doesn't necessarily signal that there was a swelling support for the CCP. I think it was more just, we're kind of done with this fighting. Yeah, man. I mean, I think there was like a, uh, a poll that someone had done, and they had found out that 90% of the population was disapproved of the job that the KMT was doing, but then it was like 80% of the population didn't care for the communists either. So they, people were just done. I think, you know, populations just have a, a limited amount of... How much suffering can you endure? Yeah, like how much suffering you can endure and also just sort of like a limited attention span, for lack of a better term, for war, especially war in like this context. Yeah, I want you to imagine the fact that by this point in time, so this is 1927, there's essentially been fighting at somewhere at some point in time in China for at least... 20 years. Yeah. And this is 
in your own country. That's so wild. Because, like, you know, we talked about an earlier episode about how in the way the war is fought today, you can... Not feel it. Yeah, you, like, you can't feel it. But, like, imagine if you were in Iraq or, <laughs> you yeah. know, one of these countries where there are boots on the ground and fighting every day for 20 years. And all you want is for your country to just stabilize and be fine. Yeah. Matter of fact, just a day without fighting. I Crazy. would just be happy for a day without fighting. And that's, you know, that's where the Chinese people were. Now, flipping gears, and this is probably a lot worse for Chang, is that that lovely place, Taiwan, that he had visited months earlier, was now suddenly not so lovely. It was not quite like Chang remembered it. So when Chang went, that was sort of towards the beginning, you know, World War II had just ended. So Taiwan hadn't been fully, I would say, reincorporated back into the Chinese nation, I would say. But by this point in time in 1947, it is increasingly brought back into the state and thousands of mainland officials flooded Taiwan and they had a new governor named Chen Yi. Now, one thing that's important to remember is like Taiwan is not that big. It's big, but it's not that big. And China is absolutely massive. It would be, ah, God, I can't think of well, it's like Jamaica to the mainland United States. Yeah. Yeah. It's like if a bunch of Americans just flooded Jamaica or, or Cuba, you know? Um, so obviously with all of these, uh, this influx of mainland Chinese, it's changing things in Taiwan. And nationalist officials, now all of that property that had been kind of up for grabs, but, you know, the people living on Taiwan had a stake in all of this. Question. Yeah. Was there like a national identity in Taiwan at this point? I mean, it's, that's very complicated. So you have indigenous Taiwanese people. Right. You also have Chinese that had migrated to Taiwan much earlier. So Taiwan was incorporated into the Qing Empire, I believe, in the 18th century. And it slowly but surely became an integral part of China. Initially, when they got it, they described it as a ball of mud. Like, ah. oh, we don't really want this, <laughs> but we'll take it. But slowly but surely, it became, you know, sacred land. But, like, did people identify themselves as I'm Taiwanese as opposed to I'm Chinese? So that's the tricky part. I mean, you have to remember, for 50 years prior to that, Taiwan had been a Japanese that's colony. True. So there's the Japanese colonial identity. You've got a Chinese identity. You've got a Taiwanese, you know, indigenous identity. All rolled up in one. So it's, I mean, even today, it's still highly complicated. Yeah. And, you know, it's not... That we, it's not easy for people to figure all of these things out. But the mainland Chinese had seized a lot of this property, $1 billion worth of property and assets. All of this land, material, things like that are now being controlled by the nationalists. And this is building a lot of resentment for the people on uh, the island. And in late February, February 28th, there's a woman who's arrested for selling cigarettes and gosh, why does it always seem like bad things happen when people get arrested for selling cigarettes? Can't be selling those Lucy's, man. No. And this touches off a major rebellion. Taiwan, basically to kind of try to calm down this rebellion that's going on, the people in Taiwan created this thing called the Taiwanese Resolution Committee. And they asked the Taiwan garrison commander, so the guy in charge of the KMT troops in Taiwan, to turn over his weapons to the resolution committee and obviously wonder how that went yeah like i feel like chong just has a really weird reaction to people like trying to disarm him or like take away his guns he'd have been a great american <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and basically chong orders chen yi to put down the rebellion I and mean, he describes this tactic as kill the chicken to scare the monkey and he killed a lot of chickens oh yeah uh the 21st division immediately sailed for taiwan and they basically you know, it was a massacre. It was essentially a massacre. But, you know, they killed between 18 and 28,000 people. Yeah. You know, I feel like in general, we have, I don't know if I would describe our accounting of Chang as sympathetic at this point, but regardless of however you want to think about the way we have been describing Chiang Kai shek, I think it's also important that we specifically note that he was capable and did carry out some very atrocious things. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's definitely a sign of the times, man. I mean, the idea that you can have 18 to 28,000 people 
killed. And it's like, this is what we need to do. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying that Taylor doesn't uh, hold him accountable for this stuff because he certainly does. But, you know, when you read Taylor's biography of Sean Kai-shek, the, the sort of image that you get in general is one of this honorable, stoic man. Yeah. And Taylor absolutely does point out these horrible things, but it is easy sometimes to lose you know, sight of that. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think it's important to remember that Taylor, he's trying to kind of sort of write this balancing act, right? He's seen for years this very, very, very dark portrayal of Chang. And obviously a lot of that is deserved, but he's also seeing that, you know, Chang was more complicated than that. Uh, so he's sort of trying to correct the historical record, which I think he gives a, po- a more positive account in an attempt to balance things out. So if you do read this book, I would recommend reading it along with the Stillwell papers, which you should be able to find on Amazon for like six cents, or maybe they'll pay you for buying it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably available online somewhere. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, read those two together and I think it'll give you a, you'll walk away with a pretty good balanced look at Chang Kai-shek. Well, so Chang in uh, February of 1947, things are going bad. He's just killed a bunch of people. On and this doesn't play well politically. Oh, heavens no. Obviously, you know, if this is going to be your last bastion of safety, last thing you want to do is poison the well. And, you know, to some extent, he certainly poisoned the well. And it wasn't until for decades later that the nationalists came out and apologized for what took place in uh, February of 1947. All right. So that is what's going on in Taiwan. But what is going on in Manchuria? Back in Manchuria, the communist strength continues to grow despite the successes that the KMT had had. The communists are still being supplied by Russia, which shares a border with Manchuria, and the communists had begun conscripting soldiers. Lin now had an army of as many as 400,000 troops. It's still crazy to me, like, the manpower. The numbers in this thing, it's insane. From the numbers that we've covered already through these last few episodes, it's like, where are all these humans coming from? Seriously, at points in time when you talk about, especially like during the Second World War with all the battles, you're just like, are there people left? Seriously. Uh, Insane. Like, it's, it's nuts. On top of those 400,000 troops, he had collected 200 heavy guns. And at this point in time, in 1947, the communists are so confident that they switch over to fighting conventional style battles. Now, you have to remember prior to this, a lot of the communist tactics are guerrilla tactics. They're attacking when the enemy is retreating or tired, but they would rarely engage in those sort of front-to-front fights. Basically, if the, if the KMT was ready, they weren't about that action. Right. You know, they weren't going to stay in the pocket and take the hit. They were going to move out the way and wait till KMT guys get tired and then hit them then. But now they're just like, you know, we're good enough to, to stand toe-to-toe with you in the middle of the ring and uh, trade blows. Um, so then you have a, a communist victory at a place called Mengliangu, which I, I have no idea where that is, to be honest. But um, Some historian. Whatever. And that's where the uh, nationalist general, Zhang Lingfu, lost about 32,000 men. Again, ridiculous number. I feel like we're just throwing these numbers out there like, oh, he lost 32,000. But that's guys. just how it is when you deal with these numbers like this. Yeah. You can't wrap your mind around how big that is. And then um, the communists surrounded Changchun and another place called Sipingjie. And Chang doesn't pull his forces back and instead sends reinforcements that actually broke Lin Biao's assault and sent his men retreating back across the Amur River, having lost 40,000 of them. Uh, so again, back and forth, seesawing battle. But what happens next, Eric? Well, General Wedemeyer is sent back to China to assess the situation. And he pretty much concludes that this whole situation is kind of a trash can fire. Real bad. Yeah. You know, corruption was rampant, but he decided that, or he didn't make any decisions, but he did recommend that the U.S. intervene and help the Chinese government. Yeah, he recommended immediate military and economic aid to Chang's regime. But Chiang Kai-shek was not told about this, and all he ever heard was Wedemeyer's basically complaints and stuff like, wow, what a corrupt regime you have. Yeah, and Marshall really took Wedemeyer's assessment to heart, right? (laughs) No, back in Washington. (laughs) So basically, Marshall did nothing with Wedemeyer's assessment. He was not in favor of the U.S. dumping more money into this trash can fire, 
So he just basically sat on Wedemeyer's report and never sent it on up the chain. This little scenario here, to me, is kind of like emblematic of things that happen in large organizations Mm -hmm. with large bureaucracies. Like, hey, we're going to send a guy over to do this report, and then we're not going to do anything with it. The report is dead. Right. It's like, I got that email. Did you forward it? No. No. Heavens no. Well, it was good that he spent that time over there doing that, but, you know, that's not the answer we were looking for, so we'll ignore it. (laughs) Right. You know, following that, things get real bad. On August 29th, a guy named Du Yuming, who was one of Chiang Kai-shek's best generals, having just defeated Lin Biao, he was the guy who broke that assault and sent Lin Biao's uh, troops fleeing across the Amur River. He is in some bad health. I don't know exactly what was wrong with him, but he wasn't feeling good. So they had to replace him. Um, with a new guy named Chen Chung. And the balance of power in Manchuria was really starting to noticeably turn bad. The communists controlled 90% of the countryside. So basically, the cities that the nationalists did control are swimming in a sea of communist soldiers. I mean, you could feel maybe relatively safe if you were in one of the cities awaiting the inevitable assault. Um, But when you waded out into the countryside... There were sharks out there. Yeah, like how safe can you actually feel knowing that they're just floating around? Not very safe. It's like, oh, I'm cool right now, but I know that this giant assault is probably coming. That's one thing that's really weird because I can't imagine being in a group of like 200,000 guys all with guns and being like, I'm not safe. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I mean, if I had 200,000 friends with guns, I'd feel like I could go anywhere. Right. Uh, But clearly this was not the case. Well, heck, the numbers that we've been throwing around these last few episodes, 200,000 isn't even that big. Well... If you haven't noticed thus far, basically what's happening in Manchuria is Chang has committed a lot of his, what, the remainder of his best troops into this region of China, but it's kind of turning into a quagmire. This was a mad gamble. I mean, I think Chang came down to the conclusion that if we're going to win this fight, we need to win it in Manchuria. And if we lose Manchuria, doesn't look like we're going to win this fight. So Chang is throwing everything he's got into the fight in Manchuria. Now, on October 2nd, 1947, Lin Biao launches his sixth offensive. In the path of this offensive uh, was Chen's 300,000 men. Only. Uh, only 300,000. He had requested 500,000. Ah, couldn't come up with that, that last 200,000. That 200, extra 200,000. So there are limits to the amount of guys that you can find and get up there. And Lin's attack ends up killing 68,000 government troops. That's, again, a lot, a lot, a lot of people. Just to try to give a little perspective, if you thought of, in this case, 68,000 people, who was the number that we that were just lost, if you thought of 68,000 in, in terms of hours, that's almost eight years. That's crazy. So many people. And 68,000 deaths isn't even that large a number in terms of you know, this conflict. Imagine if you kind of added up everyone's you know the the hours that each of those people had lived again Uh, it's so hard to think about like when you hear about these kind of deaths like when you think about like every memory every every experience every birthday every that that someone that makes a person a person just wiped out yeah crazy wild but you know back to lin biao and his troops by the end of the year lin's forces would grow to over five hundred thousand, and by november chong's troops They were in pretty bad straits. The forces under Chang up in Manchuria were really struggling with some difficult situations. Rationing and whatnot. Yeah, by the end of the year, they only had 180 bullets and insufficient daily food. Now, is that 180 bullets? That's per soldier. Man. Can you imagine, like, hey, I know that today I should only shoot X amount of bullets. Well, yeah, and especially when you think about how many bullets you shoot before you actually hit something. Yeah. Like, that's, that's not a whole lot. And, you know, the Army's obviously crumbling by this point in time but good thing that china's agrarian economy can go on forever right chong come on man well in beijing you know things are going bad enough that someone tries to kill chong Uh, he's just riding in his car and guy takes a shot at the car bullet goes through the car but doesn't hit chong kai-shek luckily for him but i think that's a sign of kind of how rough things are getting in china luckily for him there was a bullet's ration Oh, God. I don't even know if that's just like them rationing the bullets. Like, that's just all they had left. Yeah. Like, all, you, this is all you get. In South China, the communist underground is increasingly active. So realistically, at this point in time, it ain't safe to go nowhere. 
even if you're not in uh, northeastern China and Manchuria. I mean, on New Year's Day, 1948, the uh, KMT had been sort of working on this offensive that they were going to put together to kind of take back the momentum in the war. And on New Year's Day, Chen declares, the battle plans are now ready. He's going to attack the communists and win the war. But before he can launch his attack, Lin Biao launches his attack and besieges Sipingjie, and things start to look bad real quick. Most of Lin Biao's troops went to Mukden and destroyed Chang's prized new fifth army, which, if you guys go back to, I don't know, Chiang Kai-shek, like, three? I don't even remember at this point. <laughs> Earlier. This is one of the armies that had fought in Burma. So these guys have fought the Japanese. They have been through a lot. And they are defeated by the communists. They tried to retreat from the city, and they were caught between two lines of PLA soldiers as they tried to leave the city, and they were essentially destroyed. And when this happens, Chen returns to, he's recalled to Nanjing, Nanking, and is replaced by Wei Li Huang. Uh, he takes control of the fighting in Manchuria. So basically, Chang's like, well, Chen, you didn't do too great, so we're going to replace you. In February 1948, things are looking real bad for the regime. Things are so bad, even just not even talking about the fighting. You even got, like, by this point, prostitutes protesting against the government. And when you lose the prostitutes, you've probably lost, <laughs> you've probably lost everybody. Safe to say, like, the entire population, more or less, is yeah. now sick of the fighting. Right. And not even, like, at this point, they're, they are directing it at the, the KMT. They're just like, honestly, anybody but these guys, and I'd be happy. We're ready for the Qing to come back. So the nationalist currency, the FABI, had fallen from 1500 to the dollar to 180000 to the dollar. This is like Zimbabwe. If levels. you had dollars in China at this time, you were so rich. It's like, I only got 25 cents, but I'll buy this house. That's insane. Um, actually, you probably weren't that rich because. But I mean, still, like, just, just to think about that level of inflation. Oh, it's nuts. Is absolutely insane. And, I mean, it was so bad. Even the businessmen were becoming pro communist. They're like, listen, I understand communism is bad for business, but can't be this bad for business. These guys, they got to do better than these guys. So is atrocious inflation. Yeah, but Chang, while all of this bad stuff is going on, continues to pour more of his best troops into the fighting into Manchuria. Like, he's just sending people into the quicksand. But eventually, he starts to order the new general, Wei, to retreat from Manchuria. But each time he orders Wei to retreat, this guy comes up with a reason why he can't retreat. It's like, ah, oh, we're not ready. Roads aren't quite right yet. We're just, yeah, we just can't do it. And meanwhile, in the U.S., the Congress had finally approved some aid for the nationalist regime, but military aid, that is, but it wouldn't arrive until November of 1948, so much later in the year, almost the end of the year. And communist forces had knocked out one-third of the government troops in Shanxi. So this is actually an area... South of the Great Wall. South of the chicken. So you're getting into... South of the chain. The chain, I'm sorry. You're getting into the... The heartland, China. It's, it's not in Manchuria anymore. Right. This so if, fighting. If, yeah, most of the fighting we've been talking about has been taking place in Manchuria, which is far north. They are now... They're, they're in it. Yeah, they're in it. You know, this is... The fighting has spread. But, you know, amidst all of this fighting and all of these protests from prostitutes, the National Assembly opened on March 29th. And Chang gave a keynote speech that seemed very detached from what was actually going on. You know, he's probably like, you know, things aren't that bad. We doing all right? Guys, we have an agrarian economy. They can't stop us. <laughs> Never lost. But Chang, you know, at this assembly, is elected president. Hmm. Who else could it have been? But they also elect a guy named uh, Li Zongren as vice president, which this ultimately is a smack in the face to Chang, because Chang, was, Chang had told this guy, like, don't even run. Like, I don't want you to be there. But not only did he throw his name in the hat, he was elected vice president. And Chang, being Chang, just never invited him to any important meetings or conferences. Uh, so that was his way of reminding everyone that he still wasn't really pro democracy. But it says he had a lot of sleepless nights after that because he was so upset about Li Zongren being elected vice president. But July 1948, Lin Biao launches his largest attack called the Liao Shen campaign, which now his troops had swelled to. 7 
500,000. God, that's a lot of men. And a lot of these guys that the CCP are using are trained on captured U.S. arms. So, you know, they're running around with U.S. guns and material. And now the stuff that was supposed to be shooting at them, they're using to shoot at the nationalists. And the plan that Lin had hatched up was to bypass Mukden and capture a coastal city called Jinzhou. So basically, if things went bad for the nationalists and, you know, different parts of Manchuria like Mukden, they would use Jinzhou, which was a port city, to evacuate those troops by bypassing Mukden and initially capturing Jinzhou, they had essentially cut off the escape route. Chang, sensing this, was like, listen, man, we need to just go ahead and abandon Mukden. But Wei, again, just refuses. He's like, hey, I need a little bit more time. Once my guys are good to go, we'll get out of here. What was his rationale for wanting to stay? He had a lot of different rationales. One was like the weather was bad. Another one was, you know, the troops weren't fully equipped yet, so we weren't ready to move. I mean, he would always come up with some sort of reasoning. But, like, did he not realize how bad the situation was? That, like, he he should be retreating? I mean, it seemed, probably seemed like, Chong should have been scratching his head, because it's like, hey, man, get out of there. And I was like, nah, man, we're fine. But there's the other thing, is that leaving the city was a very real problem. You know, you remember, I believe Chong's new fifth army tried to get out of there. They didn't make it very far. That's true. So the concerns were, to some extent, real, obviously. But I feel like staying in the city just courted certain death. Yeah. Anyway, Chang, to try to save the situation, sends two government strike forces towards Jinzhou while the actual forces in Jinzhou counterattacked. So you've got two forces coming in and you've got the forces from inside Jinzhou counterattacking. And this battle rages for a while. And all the while, the economy continues to get worse and worse. So remember... <laughs> You keep hitting new, new Lows. floors. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, all right, it's not going to be any worse than this. Nope, wrong again. Yeah, so, I mean, we started, we left off at the economy so bad the prostitutes aren't happy mm-hmm. level. Um, <laughs> that the businessmen have become communists. Right, that's, that's when you really know you've hit rock bottom. <laughs> but we can go lower. By this point in time, one bag of rice in China sold for 6.7 million in Chinese currency. How are people even carrying around money at this point? I have no idea. You know what I mean? Like, they have to have... People can't have been actually... This reminds me of Germany in world, after World War I, where you hear the stories of people just having, like, wheelbarrows of cash. And they're like, okay, here's a million Deutschmarks? I don't know. Well, that's like... It, it always... You know, the example that always comes to mind to me, I think, was the... Was it Zimbabwe? They oh, had, like, yeah. the trillion-dollar note or whatever. Because Man. it was... Because... Money had become so inflated. But $6.7 million for a bag of rice actually wasn't bad. Because by June of 1948, that same bag of rice would cost you $63 million in Chinese currency. So crazy. That's by, oh, I'm sorry, by August, it'd be $63 million in Chinese currency. So that can kind of give you an idea of how bad the situation is turning for the nationalists. Because it's like, we ain't got a lot of faith in this. I'm going to need $63 million for this bag of rice. Seriously. <laughs> And to try to stabilize the situation, Chang's regime issues what they called the, uh, the gold yuan and requested that people trade in their old currency and whatever gold or silver you had on hand to exchange it for this new gold currency. Now, were areas that were controlled by the communists having any better luck with their... Mm. Like, I guess, is there, was there a marked difference in the economy uh, in places where the communists were in control? That's a really good question. You know, I'm not 100% sure. I would imagine yes to some extent. But one thing is, too, is that the communists at this point in time, they're occupying a lot of rural areas. Okay. And again, they may have been on a more agrarian economy. So probably the importance of actual cash currency was less um, in the regions that they controlled. But the communists were able to actually, I think, administer their economics better than the nationalists were at this point in time. All right. Well, we'll leave that as a we're not 100% sure yet, but you know when we'll get the answer, Melvin? When somebody calls in and complains? No, when we cover Mao in the future. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll get, we'll get it then. So with the currency going, with things going bad, Chang sends his son, Qin Kuo, which we haven't talked about in a while, to Shanghai to try to implement this new currency program. And he ends up arresting, if you guys remember, 
the green some green gang members because obviously the green gang is into some dirty stuff and they actually arrest the head of the green gang a guy who did a lot of the really dirty underhanded things do you Shung. but when they arrest you know these gangsters a lot of them start spilling the beans on members of sort of chang's extended family they're like yeah what about you know what about your uncle david kung he's doing some really bad stuff I and mean, this really breaks out some some family strife in the middle of, obviously, as if Chang doesn't have enough going on. Now I've got my son trying to arrest some of my, my in-laws. And Chang's wife is like, listen, you need to come down here and solve this. I know you're dealing with a major battle up in Manchuria, but you need to come down here and help us take care of this uh, family issue we're having because your son's trying to lock up my brother or uncle or some, some sort of relation. And as all married men know, when the wife issues the mandate, mm-hmm. you follow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he literally left a battlefield in which they're losing to go and deal with a family issue. That's not even a life or death family issue. An unmarried Arif Jadala might have been surprised. <laughs> a married Arif Jadala is not. Yeah. I was going to say, like, I feel like the only real excuse for you to leave under those circumstances is like, hey, my dad needs a, a kidney. I'm the only one that's a match. I'll be right back. And one of the generals who was, was you know, in charge of the fighting up there named Fu Zuoyi states that Chang loves beauty more than he loves the throne. That's deep. That is. That's heavy stuff, man. So Chang races back to Shanghai and then ends up back up in uh, the battlefield by October of 1948. But neither strike force that he was trying to get up there to relieve the pressure at Jinzhou actually make it to Jinzhou. PLA sappers, in the meantime, had blown holes in the walls of Jinzhou and were close to taking the city. Chang, doing what Chang normally does, just ends up sending more troops... Resigns. ...to Jinzhou. No, no, not this time. <laughs> not yet. But on October 15th, Jinzhou finally falls. The garrison of 122,000 men had 34... Thousand killed or wounded in action, and eighty-eight thousand taken prisoner, which is real bad because the ch- the communists are really good at capturing you and then convincing you to fight for their cause. Yeah. So again, he's just yeah. adding to their force. Just adding. You know, it's like the. I, I, this is not to say that the communists are necessarily bad, but it reminds me of the Game of Thrones, the White Walkers. Yeah. Where it's just like you don't want to lose an army to those guys because then you got to fight them again. And again, and again, and again. And they just keep getting bigger. That's basically what uh, Chang was dealing with right now. Man. He was trying to tell him winter was coming. No one believed him. Winter was coming. <laughs> Literally from the north. Dude, the parallels. Maybe he just stole the whole story from the Chinese Revolution. He might have. I think he actually based it more on the War of Roses. Nah, Chinese Revolution. I'm going to go with that. And on October 19th... George R. R. Martin is actually a Chinese nationalist. Probably. On October 19th, Chang, maybe this is giving us clues about the ending of Game of Thrones. Who's Sean Kashek on Game of Thrones then? Jon Snow. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, on October 19th, John, I mean, Chiang Kashek holds a meeting with his top generals and, you know, very upset, just ends up blaming Marshall, saying it was the Americans that told me to pour all these troops into this quagmire in Manchuria. Not really taking responsibility for the fact that he thought things were looking pretty good and that he probably should do this. So, I mean, this is kind of sort of an admission of things are looking bad, we probably ain't gonna make it. You know, good luck. And that month, Lin eliminated the last strike force of Chang's best forces, killing 70,000 of them, capturing 38,000. And the uh, Changchun garrison surrendered after the last strike force was eliminated. Which leaves us into November of 1948, and you have 140,000 of Chang's troops, basically a lot of the remaining troops in Manchuria, being evacuated out of Huludao. And essentially, at that point, the battle for Manchuria was over. And you know what probably is the most unfortunate part about all of this? What is was that it? General Wei may have been a traitor. Huh. This may explain why he kept stopping Chang from pulling those 300 troops out. Most of those guys, those 300,000 troops that he was in charge of, most of those guys end up joining the PLA. I mean, the next time they would fight would be against the Americans in the Korean War. Huh. Yeah, interesting. That is interesting. Um, and Chang would return to Nanjing. Nanjing. He just built a church, um, and he delivered a sermon, which is pretty interesting about what he says. He says, you know, as for me, I had in my heart to build a house of rest for the covenant of the Lord. But God said, said unto me, 
thou shalt not build a house for my name because thou has been a man of war. Hmm. And then he says, the lesson of his sermon was man proposes, but God disposes. And it seems like he was pretty disposed to, we ain't gonna make it. Yeah. It seems like if I recall correctly at this point, he had a pretty, I don't know, pessimistic attitude is the, the correct term, but he, he definitely doesn't seem to be feeling super confident about the way the war was going. Yeah, I would say he's uh, got a realistic view now. Yeah. But this uh, leads us into the Huai Hai campaign, which is essentially the final domino to fall. This is the major invasion of the uh, Chinese communists of northern China. Du Yuming, Chang's probably best general, is back in the fight, but this time he's in northern China. And he's thinking about retreating and pulling his troops down. You know, a lot of the, what people are thinking is that you need to retreat these troops south of China's major rivers, south of the Yangtze River, and work from there. Basically, you can defend that space and have a divided China. But Chang tells Du Yuming to remain north with his 450,000 KMT troops, but he's attacked by Lin Biao's 750,000 troops. And other parts of China are also quickly coming under attack. Tianjin is coming under attack, or a city. Uh, an area near Tianjin, and the communists are basically overrunning all of northern China. The KMT leaders that were in charge of defending the area near Tianjin end up committing suicide, and 3,000 of the government troops escaped. And now everybody could see that the... The writing is on the wall. Yeah, the nationalist regime is about to fall, yeah. and people are freaking out. Except for Chang. <laughs> yeah, Chang was remarkably calm. I mean, it probably feels pretty good to just know, like, oh, well, I tried. This is it. Just going to accept my fate now. And the CCP surrounded Pu Zuoyi's forces in Peking. And this is, you know, another 240,000 of the nationalist regime's uh, veterans. And he, again, orders Pu Zuoyi to stand his ground. So that means now we have Pu Zuoyi standing his ground and the general Du Yuming. Man, that's got to take some cojones. Yeah. Both just, of these guys are doomed. Yeah. To just know. Doomed. But it, probably at this point in time, what Chang is doing is having them stand his ground so that he can organize things for the retreat to Taiwan. And Du Yuming's troops are in such bad straits that Du reports back that his men are reduced to eating tree bark and burning houses for warmth. Man. That's how bad things had gotten for them. But by January, Chang had moved most of the, the Air Force headquarters and the Navy headquarters to Taiwan. And most of the remaining aircraft had also been moved, which is going to be very important because if they're going to survive on the island, they have to be able to stop communist assaults across the Taiwan Strait. So, so the, by this point, Chang knew that he was heading to Taiwan. Oh, absolutely. He's setting up everything to get his guys and everything over to Taiwan. So in the midst of all this, Chinese ports are just in pure chaos because everybody's trying to get out. You know, they're just like, you know what? I don't care where I'm going. Maybe I'm going to Taiwan. Maybe I'm going to the U.S. Maybe I'm going to France. But I ain't I staying know. here. I ain't staying here. And also what they're doing is they're evacuating a lot of China's old treasures and important things from the mainland to Taiwan, which obviously is a major issue right now because you have a lot of very important Chinese artifacts that were evacuated during that time. So, and they're still in Taiwan to this very day. But that's what the, the nationalists were doing. They were shipping people and priceless treasures to the island. And on the uh, 6th of January, so now we're in 1949, um, the PLA launches their final attack on Du Yuming. And Du Yuming, to his credit, him and his troops fought to the very end. Du had been, obviously, one of Chang's best generals, had been with him even during World War II. Chang sends a radio, a message out saying, hey, I know things are bad, I'm sending the plane to come get you. But the day before the plane was to leave, Du Yuming's guys were defeated and routed in battle. And Du was, you know, loyal to the end. This is sort of reminiscent of the unit from, I don't know if you've seen the movie Dunkirk, mm. that more mm. or less stuck it out. and Just to hold off. Though. Just to hold off so that the evacuation at Dunkirk could be uh, carried out. Unimaginable. Yeah. Can you imagine being told like, hey, we just need you guys to fight and die here so the rest of these guys can get out of here? Yeah. There's a scene in that movie that came out, I think it was last year, about Winston Churchill. It was like Finest Hour or whatever it yeah, was. I watched the, that. The scene of him communicating with that unit. Like, yeah. this is kind of what it has to be. And it's crazy. People are capable of some incredible courage yeah. in those situations. I watched that movie on the way to England. There you go. Yeah. But that's exactly what happened. And, you know, we all need to find friends that will fight for you like Do You Ming fought for Chiang Kai shek. Find someone who will look at you like Du Yuming looked at Chiang Kai-shek. Yeah. And in mid-January, so after defeating Du Yuming's troops, Mao sends out a cable for unconditional surrender 
you know, which obviously if Chong had been in the same situation, he would have done the exact same thing. And he, in this cable, wanted Chong and the members of the Sung family to sit for trials as war criminals. This did not include Sung Ching Ling, which if you remember from earlier episodes, she was the one that had been sending Mao money. It right. was basically like the closet communist, but they never told Chiang Kai-shek about this. Uh, so she was excluded from that call to I imagine be tried. Chiang getting this cable. And it's like, honey, it's strange. They've listed everyone in our family except for your sister. And then gives her that sideways look. On January 21st, uh, 1949, Chiang does the typical Chiang thing. What's that, Arif? Resigns. Yep, he's like, you know what? It wasn't like a full resignation, but it was a partial resignation. Uh, basically, he stepped down. I'm out. And on January uh, 22nd, the day after he resigns, Chang goes on and pens his uh, explanation on why he believes the nationalist regime under his control failed to maintain China, why their, their goal, their revolution fell apart. And he says that, you know, this was in large part because China was caught in a transitionary period between old systems not being abolished and new systems still not being built. And to a degree, he's right. I think what Chang's greatest problem was in trying to control China was the fact that he tried to do too many halfway measures. And if we remember one thing, it's that there's no such things as halfway crooks. So when he was building up his military, he would take in warlords, take in the you know, guys that really didn't have revolutionary credentials and were really devoted to the revolution. They were devo- you know, devoted to their own power. So a lot of his military guys were you know, rotten to some extent. A lot of his administrators were also rotten to a different extent. And the thing is, is when the communists came into power, they took power in the region, it was centralized. It was all about, you know, the communist. You guys were either getting in line, you were going to stay down or lay down, get in line or, or get out the way. No halfway crooks from exactly. the communist perspective. They were mob deep, as some may say. <laughs> uh, exactly. So that day they left on a, uh, Chang left Nanjing on a plane called the Meiling. And he ends up uh, having dinner with Chen Yi, the guy that was in charge of the Taiwan massacre. And, you know, this was a very cold dinner, in part because they didn't have heating where they had dinner. <laughs> but it was also cold because Chang was getting ready to arrest Chen Yi and have him executed for talking to the communists. From that uh, dinner, Chang moves on to Shiko, which, if you remember from episode one, that's pretty much his hometown, uh, where he stayed for a while. And he, you know, would hang out in the mountains and just think about stuff. Fu Zuoyi, the guy who's in charge of the defense at Beijing, finally surrenders the city to the communist. And he did this. He, he waited for Chang to step down before he surrendered the city. But yeah, Chang's in the, up in the cabin in the mountains near his mother's grave, just kind of thinking about stuff. Because when you think about it, they're about to get run out of China. He may never see this place again. And Li Zongren now being in charge, tries to negotiate peace with the communist, but all of his attempts fail, and the KMT government has to move its capital down to Canton in southern China. And Chang, he's just getting ready to leave mainland China, but in the meantime, he flies to Shanghai, and he promises that the battle for Shanghai will be another Stalingrad, and that it's going to be the turning point of this war, and it's going to be bloody, and we're not giving up an inch. Uh, but, which, was, which is very clearly a bluff. Yeah, it was just all talk. Uh, Shanghai was going to fall regardless of if they fought for it or not. And on May 6th, Chang left for Taiwan on the SS Kuangjing. And, uh, you know, by that point in time, there's 5,000 refugees that are arriving in Taiwan per day. A relatively small island, that's a lot for Taiwan to take on. But now Chang has relocated to Taiwan. You know, that's where he's going to live out the rest of his days. Yeah, and, you know, he spends a relatively long time in Taiwan, you know, the rest of his life. But in the interest of not having a seven-part series on Chiang Kai-shek, we are going to move through it relatively quickly. So understand that he did spend, from a timeline perspective, a solid chunk of his life in Taiwan. Yeah. The Taiwan days do not receive the length of treatment that the previous part of his life received on the life of X. Obviously, if you want to learn more about this, you can pick up the book and you know, read the last few chapters, and you'll get the the you know, very the nitty gritty detailed rundown of life in uh, Taiwan, which is actually really interesting. Obviously, you can we could go on for another seven episodes, but we will not. Yeah. <laughs> so when he gets to Taiwan, one thing that he's really interested in is reorganizing the party. 
And it's important to remember, you know, he's billing himself as this sort of enlightened authoritarian leader. Again, he has a very long period in Taiwan where he is basically the head honcho. It's a, it's, it's a dictatorship. There's no way around that. Uh, he considered himself a philosopher king. Yeah. But when he first got there, man, he's rooting out communists. They, you know, conduct 10,000 interviews and they ended up, you know, executing a thousand people. But he's also caught up with the defense of Taiwan because realistically, the Taiwan, you know, the Chinese Civil War is not over. Now you have the Republic of Taiwan. I'm sorry, the Republic of China, obviously, um, which is now based in Taiwan. And you have the People's Republic of China, which is established in October 1949 on the mainland. You know, in Taiwan, they, they established a remarkably stable currency. So for, finally, they get the, the economics right. But all the while, the U.S. is still expecting the collapse of the regime on Taiwan. One thing that really stood out to me, and this is not necessarily chronological, in terms of a theme of Chung's time in Taiwan in regard to U.S. relations, is that he is always pushing through the Kennedy, LBJ, Nixon all these leaders, he's always begging, give me the, the resources I need to retake the mainland. Like, we can do this. I just need more resources. And it seems like some politicians in the U.S. are more sympathetic to his cause, but no one is ever willing to commit the military power and aid it would have taken to try to take back the mainland. And eventually, they just sort of come to the realization that, like, Mao is who we are, or the communists are who we're going to be dealing with in China. Yeah, you know, one interesting thing is, as you said, they're not willing to commit to helping Chang retake Taiwan. I mean, retake the mainland. But they are very interested at a certain point in time in helping him maintain power right. um, in Taiwan. So, obviously, a few years later, the Korean War breaks out. And that brings U.S. troops directly up against Chinese communists, and we find out really quickly how good the communists are, and we realize we've got our hands full. Um, so we start at that very moment. We're like, "Listen, hey, Chang, we got your back, buddy. We need you to uh, keep it together." And there's a who was it that was talking about? You know what we need to do? There's a lot of rhetoric in the U.S. about unleashing Chiang Kai-shek. Yeah, that was Eisenhower during his uh, 1952 run-up to the election when he had promised to repudiate the Yalta Agreement, roll back the Iron Curtain, end the war in Korea, and unleash the Generalissimo against Red China. You know what I really love about this is that there's all this criticism, right, of Chiang Kai-shek and his ability to prosecute a war. And now suddenly, in the early 1950s, Chiang Kai-shek has become this unstoppable force. Right, the answer. If, if only we would just unleash him, he would retake the mainland and we'd win the Korean War yeah. and roll back communism. Irony. Which, if we fast forward, I don't know if you remember this, Jeb Bush referred to Chiang Kai-shek as a mystical warrior friend. I don't remember that, but I really wish that I did. Oh, let me just read the quote. Chiang is a mystical warrior. Chiang is somebody who believes in conservative principles, believes in entrepreneurial capitalism, believes in moral value that underpin a free society. This was Jeb Bush? Yeah. When did this happen? Uh, 2007. 2008, sometime around there. He was talking about a sword that he, his family had received from Chiang Kai-shek, and he was like, this guy was a mystical warrior. Check this sword out. He believed in conservative principles. Wow. Yeah, All right. So, so Chiang Kai-shek, he's got a lot of faces in the U.S. Seriously. Memory. But, you know, his time in Taiwan was initially marked by, you know, obviously the, the, dictator, the dictatorship, and he was essentially a dictator until he died in 1975. But one thing I did, I did want to point out too about that is that according to Taylor, Taiwan, even though, you know, understand that all of this is taking place under a dictatorship, but like the economy, he was able to, or he and his son and the people that, you know, were working under him were actually able to create a relatively prosperous Taiwan. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of that, they were very successful initially when they got to Taiwan. And also, you know, when they had the, the U.S. backing, that right. also... A lot of U.S. Uh, money flowing through. A lot of U.S. money flowing through. Because a lot of the ways that we looked at Taiwan and even Japan is we looked at it as this unsinkable aircraft carrier, right? Stationed off of the coast of China. So it was in our interest to have, you know, military bases there, good relations with Taiwan. I mean, really, this is all tied up into that economic miracle that you see taking place in the region during the 19, late 50s and 60s. So Japan's economy, despite being destroyed after... World War II has rebounded and is looking really good. South Korea's economy after the Korean War really starts to pick up. 
um, and Taiwan's economy also picks up during this period. So there's a lot of economic growth that takes place in that region. And one other thing that Chang does is he's successful in enacting some land reform that he had tried to do on the mainland, but was unable to. I mean, it looks like Taiwan offered them sort of a blank slate where they could get a lot of things right that they screwed up initially. And uh, I don't think they actually, you know, obviously have the land reform, but I don't think they actually have like elections until, you know, Kuomintang sponsored elections until 1972. But basically by the 70s, it seems like the United States was sort of over like this idea that Chang would ever or the KMT would ever be the representative government of China. Well, you know, the interesting thing is we had a two China policy. Okay. Right. So we didn't recognize the People's Republic of China. We recognized the Republic of China as the rightful government of the Chinese people. So imagine that. And what we did for a long time was the Republic of China, based in Taiwan, maintained the seat in the United Nations as the rightful representative of the Chinese people. Right. Obviously, this irked the leaders in the People's Republic of China, and they fought for two decades to get that seat. And in, I believe, 1972, thanks in large part to some of uh, the People's Republic of China's inroads into the Global South, Africa, Asia, South America, they're able to reclaim that seat despite U.S. objections from Kissinger. in the U.N. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you have Sino-U.S. rapprochement in 72. What you started to see was we still support Taiwan wholeheartedly, but we also started moving towards improving relations with the People's Republic of China in the 1970s. And a lot of countries also did the same thing. So, And that, that sort of spelled like the absolute end to the chances of the KMT actually ever controlling the mainland. Yeah. It's, it's not going to happen. Um, and really, right now, the question is, will Taiwan be absorbed into the People's Republic of China? And that's a question for the Chinese people to figure out. And you mean today, like in today. 2018? It's still, a, it's still a discussion today. But, but just to, to wrap up on Chang's actual life then. Yeah. On April 5th, 1975, Chang's heart stops beating. And initially, doctors are called in and they give him all these like stimulants or whatever to bring him back momentarily. But after like five, I think it was that Taylor says, Sung Mei Ling, it's like, all right, that's enough. We're going to let him go. Yeah. And that is exactly what happened. And uh, Chiang Kai-shek died on April 5th, 1975. Yeah. And this is like, you know, 75, 76. A lot of those guys that had battled it out for the, to the right to birthing a modern China, they start dying off. Yeah. Chiang Kai-shek dies in uh, 75. Mao and Zhou Enlai would die a year later. Um, it's the end of an era. Yeah. So I guess, you know, we've gone a little long. So thank you all for hanging with us. But I, I would like to ask you from like your, your reading and your research and that sort of stuff, like what is Shang's legacy in China right now? As of like 2018, when we record this, like how is he remembered? So where are we talking about? Are we talking about Taiwan or are we talking about on the mainland? Well, let us explore both. Well, I think on the mainland, up until relatively recently, so I'd say within the last decade or two, Chiang Kai-shek was really still kind of viewed as a villain. Um, but I think in Chinese circles, they're producing a much more nuanced picture of him now. You know, now there's a much greater discussion about Chiang Kai-shek's role as a, as a leader fighting the Japanese. So the picture of Chiang Kai-shek in Ta on the mainland is becoming more complicated. I think it's still, in a lot of ways, very, you know antagonistic and simplistic and you know a lot of people well because obviously the prc is still in power yeah i mean it's hard to you know in one breath uplift uplift mao zedong and in the same breath uplift the person, Shek, yeah the, right the the guy who you know spent all these years trying to kill him yeah diametrically opposed forces but i think it's, it's come a long way and in the u.s we've moved from obviously just having a very negative picture of chiang kai-shek to one that's more uh Nuanced. Nuanced, right? And we understand why we had that picture. You know, we say like a lot of the journalists that were in China at the time, you know, had this certain view of Chiang Kai-shek and Stillwell, and this all filtered into our picture of Chiang. But realistically, he was probably far more complex than just being a failure. Sure. Um, but how, how's he viewed in Taiwan? Obviously, Taiwan, he's viewed with much more reverence, right? Which is kind of surprising. I mean, obviously, we didn't dive super deep into his time on Taiwan, but 
just from being the man who had ordered the massacre yeah. and and having been like a dictator in Taiwan. I mean, the, the, not to say that it's it's a simple picture. You know, I think in Taiwan, you know, at the top, you've got Sun Yat-sen, mm-hmm. who is also revered in China, mainland China, and below him, then you have Chiang Kai-shek. So in the mainland, they also acknowledge Chiang's failures. And in Taiwan, no, I'm sorry, not Chiang, Mao Zedong's failures. But also in Taiwan, they acknowledge Chiang Kai-shek's failures and the shortcomings of his party. Um, so I think, you know, Taiwan is like, there's a lot of media in Taiwan. They've got more, probably more news sources per capita than almost anywhere in the world. And they, I think, they're not strangers to being critical of the KMT. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, discussions about what Chang did, you know, against either the Aboriginal, the indigenous people of Taiwan, or against, you know, just the general population in Taiwan, like, they have those discussions. But overall, the, the picture you would say is more positive. Yeah, I mean, I think they have a, you know, obviously he's like a founding father. Okay. You know, one that they can be critical of, but he's an important figure for them. All right. I'd say it's more positive than, obviously, the uh, mainland picture. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a complicated figure. I hope that that's what's come out from uh, this podcast, yeah. is that, you know, Chang wasn't all bad, but he certainly wasn't all good. He wasn't no saint. Do you have any other final thoughts on Chiang Kai-shek? Oh, uh, man, I don't know. I feel like we got it all out, man. Six I'm, episodes. Six, six episodes. I hope you guys aren't tired of Chang. I hope you guys all go pick up the book and just dive deeper. Into dive in. I mean, honestly, when you read this book, it's just, there are so many other people that I want to now go and look at their biographies and hopefully we'll cover some of them on the show. Oh man. And I mean, even for me being a, a China, you know, specialist, it's hard for even me to keep up with some of like all of these names yeah. and places, but there's so much there, man. It's such a rich history. Yeah. Let us know if you liked this sort of thing. You know, obviously these past six episodes have been more Melvin heavy because he is the specialist. And if you are someone who really enjoys the, in-depth look at China and that sort of thing. We can certainly incorporate more of these episodes where we kind of tap Melvin's expertise more. What about tapping your expertise, Eric? Well, we don't have an expertise. And by we, I mean me. Uh, <laughs> I don't have an expertise. So... Eric has a master's degree in history, internet. What was it? What? It was diplomatic history, and my focus was U.S. Middle East, but... So if we cover anyone from the Middle East, that's all you? Absolutely not. Because at the master's level, it's just broad reading for the most part. All right. Well, with that... Friends, we will wrap on part six of Sean Kai-shek. Thank you for sticking with us. Before we go, we would like to remind you how you can support the podcast. Melvin, how can they do so? The first thing that I would do is uh, leave a five-star rating, subscribe, and uh, write us a review if you like. Write us a review. It's very helpful in terms of helping people find us. And if they happen to stumble across us and they see that, wow, so many people love this show that they have taken the time. To submit a written review, it must be fantastic. I, too, will give this an opportunity. So please leave us a written review. Additionally, you can head to thelifeofxpodcast.com, click through to our support page, where you will find a link to our Audible page, where you can receive a free audiobook when you sign up for a monthly subscription to audible.com, which is a gigantic purveyor of audiobooks. And if you like podcasts, you will love Audible. You can also help us by buying things on Amazon.com through our portal, which you will also find a link to on our support page. Lastly, if you would like to directly support the podcast, you can do so through Patreon on a episode-to-episode basis. You can sign up for our tiers, help us reach our goals. They are on our Patreon page. You can read about them there. We will be happy to send you things like stickers and coffee mugs and T-shirts. Lots of T-shirts. That's right. We have swag. Go and receive it by visiting our Patreon page. Thank you so much. For sticking with us through six episodes. That's right. Signing off, I'm Eric Chidala. And I'm Melvin Barnes. And this has been The Life of X. (laughs) 